was hoping when Doc and I did this for the masters uh, in real estate, uh, I mean, in, in uh, theology, I said, well, this is the greatest way to teach here. You, you have the remoteness of the 21st century, but yet the personnel of the classroom. You know, so now people can actually see, we can see people from the screen, like I can see Doc right now. And if, and if there was 50 people on here, now well, there could be people on here that is on their phone. Exactly. And they can certainly hear me and ask questions. <laughs> because everybody has questions. Well, what if, what if, what if? And that's the fun part about doing this mastermind thing. That's the beauty of what Green was supposed to be. But what I'm finding out is people still need more. I mean, we go in front of things all the time. We all do, you know. How many here bought a house? You know, 80 percent of the people don't raise that. Who, who, you know, I, I always go there. How many? Who bought 10 houses this month? <laughs> and I, and nobody. Uh, oh wait, I done that. I bought one house this month. You know. And then only if I want one house this year, you know. And then only it's still, you know, I usually get up and walk to the door behind me. Is this the right class? Because I thought this was real estate investing group. Uh, first off, you're not a group. And this is why I, another reason why we have green. <clears throat> I said, this is not a group. You know, there's 200 people in this room. And you're all fighting each other for the deals. So there's no group. There's 200 individual investors. Well, what happens if some, somebody comes in the front of the room with a deal? You have 200 people going to be rushing to the front trying to get the deal. Guess what happens to the price? It goes up. In this room, many times when we have a deal, two or three or four people will say, hey, you want to do it together? We, you know, hey, uh, I got the money, I got the repair, I got the contractors, uh, you know, I'll do the closing. Yeah, so what? Five of us split the money, what do I do? But at least we didn't raise the price, we got it at the lowest price. Five of us split it, it's, it's easy to do, heck, we can get here. Five people, we can buy a hundred properties, you know, as opposed to each person, I can buy one myself, take me three months to fix it. Yes. That's not, that's, that's a hobby, maybe, you know? <clears throat> well, anyway, uh, you know, the reason I don't say a lot of things about green is because usually you can see people here all the time. So we'll start. Welcome to Green, the Global Real Estate Education Network. You ready, Marcus? Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. All these are recorded. They're also live. If you have friends, Anywhere in the country, anywhere out of the country. I had people, I read it was in Russia watching the show. Uh, we had people from Alaska, we had people from Australia watching this. China. China. Uh, I have a teacher from England who's going to be teaching for us. He teaches me to breathe. He said, Mark, the reason your voice is shot because you're not breathing. So <clears throat> breathe. We try to help people buy real estate the right way. It is imperative that they do that because going down the same path all the time, well, that's, that's why we're all here. We keep on, even us who buy, who, who do this every day for a living. Tiger Woods did every day for a living. What happened to him? Once one thing, one, one golf club through the back window, and his whole life was shot for 10 years. You know, he uses a coach to, you know, my, my, my sister-in-law is a professional golfer and she teaches people. Uh, I know many pro golfers that used to go up there and just teach you how to putt. Yeah. And she teaches them how to putt. I mean, they know how to putt. But we get in this rut of what we did every day and it just seems to be getting further away. Well, I'm doing the same thing I did yesterday. Yeah, I should be getting better at it. <laughs> yeah, but see, that's not, you're getting better this way, but that thing's starting to drift off here. 
Uh, I got a friend in Florida, a 40 year broker, builds million dollar houses, lives in a million dollar house, cries every day. She knows him, calls me every day. You know, and I was hopeless when he started calling me like eight years ago. And, and he's crying, and I'm happy. I'm so, he said, how can you be happy? You're, you're living in a cave. I said, well, how can you be sad? You have a million dollar house. He collects baby grand pianos. He has like 30 of them. I said, well, I want you to sell one of those and pay your mortgage, you know? He says, I can't, no, I can't sell real estate anymore. Nobody buys off me. Some, some young guy came into the, their country club, you know, community, and he takes them all drinking and golfing, and I don't drink or golf. I said, well, adapt or die. He doesn't even text today. He still doesn't text. I, I, I said, well, learn how to use I can't use a computer. I said, well, that's the attitude. You know, I have that feeling sarcasm. Well, that's a good attitude to have. I can't do a computer. I said, I go to the library all the time, and there's all these old people doing these computer classes. They couldn't do it either, but you know what? That's where I got that art. You know, texting. I said, you know, we do the same thing. Uh, I stop buying property. Well, you, know, you get tired of it, or you get bored, or whatever. You lost your mojo. I keep telling them, I lost my mojo. Why? Because you don't have any friends, friends who are doing it with you. You have friends that are golfing and sailing and fishing and all the other things. But if you have a couple friends of yours that are actually doing it with you, and Bill just called me back up after a year of hiatus, <laughs> he said, I don't have a mentor. I don't have anybody you know, he probably knows a thousand people who are mentor material for you. But he just hasn't met him or called him or whatever. I'm glad he's here. I hope he finds one here. But if you're not hanging around with the, with the guys that are going your direction, now you do it all by yourself and it just gets boring. Look at this. We're all old people. All right. So we've been there, done that. Not that it's bad. I mean, it's actually good. Because, you know, we know so much cool stuff. But we don't hang together, so they said, you're doing it by yourself, he's doing it by himself, he's doing it by himself, all the same. Let's all do it together. We can make, you know what's funny? We can make, we all put our heads together and start buying real estate. Just like, I, I was going to start this last year, two years ago, the old Lions Club. You know, we were all lions of our industry back in the day. You had a big construction company. I had a big construction company in you know, real estate. You know, Larry, we were all kings. When I used to come up to Nashville, everybody used to just pour tickets on. I had tickets to everything. Some tickets everything. But anyway, now I had to buy them. Uh, before, people just give me stuff for coming up here. And so, I don't know if I got bored because yeah, sometimes you don't want all that stuff, you know. But if the five of just the five of us, six of us in this room, got together and say, you know what, screw everybody else, let's just do it ourselves. You know, like property we would probably own in, 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 in six. Forget the hundred. You know, I tell people I'm gonna buy a hundred properties in the next eight, yeah, 180 days. But I can do that blindfold. You imagine we can buy ten thousand homes. If we put our mind to collecting money and this and that, we'd have a lot of stuff. But again, so now we do that. Let's just say we did that and we just got 10,000 houses that made a half a billion dollars. You know what? We're the kind of people that, okay, now what? You know? The money didn't really mean that much to us before. And now having 20 times that much money, it's still a, because there's nothing to do with it. There's no friends again. You know, yeah, well, we all went to Dubai, and we all went to Thailand. All right, now what? 
this is why we do great. This is what uh, I like to give back. Uh, not that I don't need the money myself, but you know what? Doing things for me at our age, our kids are gone, or you know, they're doing their own thing, they're happy. <clears throat> Most of us have ex-wives, some of us still have wives. So, and, and, and that's pretty much self-sufficient. So we don't have any goals. We, we, we don't want our, what's the cool stuff? We, we, we need that, we, we need something to go for. My thing to go for, I do prison ministry stuff, my thing to go for is to, to try to help people out. It's a frustrating endeavor because people just don't want to learn from experienced people. But I'm going to keep trying. But, you know, we all have our goal. I think we should be thinking of what, why are we here? Are we here to make more money? No, you know, sure, I need another shovel. Uh, but really, why are we here? What, what, what are we doing? If we're here to make a legacy, make a difference in, in our lives, then maybe we want to make a difference in somebody else's life. Because it doesn't mean what, what do you think of yourself when you die? You're not giving me the eulogy. You're not going to be sitting up here saying, that Mark, boy, he was a nice guy. Somebody else is going to be doing it. And I don't know what they're thinking. Not that I worry about that. What do they think? But I want, I hate to be preaching. Um, I sound like a preacher. But anyway, I think we should start. That, that may be our theory, to, uh, theme today is, why are we sitting here? Why isn't everybody else here? No, uh, that's a serious question. <clears throat> we know what we're doing, and we still are here, and we're trying to figure out the next generation of what we want to do. Um, we should be trying to get those people who are lost in the woods, and that's that's why we really started this company. That there's people lost out there in the woods. And they're going to be getting divorced and, and getting uh, bankrupt and foreclosed, all this stuff, which is, uh, which is a darn shame because it's just a, some silly little educational things that they're not doing. So I think I want to put that out to you guys today. That was our, that's my theolo theological message today. Is, uh, is let's do something that, that is meaningful to us and, and really understand why we, and Christian, you guys might not be here next week. I say, hey, I'm going to do something. <laughs> I found out, I, I looked into myself and I decided I don't want to do real estate anymore, I want to do something. <clears throat> but uh, that might be a good thing to be thinking of this week. Why are we here and what are we in this for? Um, to make more money or to make a difference in people's lives. Anyway, uh, this is week three, I believe. It seemed like you were here forever, but then it's only been three weeks. We were talking about we were talking about foundations. Now, foundations are some of to us who know and been there. It is the greatest wealth builder around. Because when we see a house that has a big foundation crack in it, and everybody else saw it too and backed off it, the price of that house drops like a rock. I mean, mold, you, know, if you might be able to take 10,000, 20,000 off a mold house, a burnout, okay, you know what a burnout, you got the flood house that you're talking about. But those require a lot of work. Molds don't because that's why they're only a ten thousand hour deduction, and you can go in there uh, if if the the guys in the suits don't come, uh, you can make some good money. But with the foundation problem, everybody everybody wants to back off because it's a pretty serious, major. The you know the city slaps that 
this house has to be you know, torn down kind of the thing. Well, that brought, that brings that price of that house down eighty thousand, hundred thousand dollars. But if we knew what we were looking at, if we knew that, well, you know, I do a lot of these foundation lifts, and I know that this one can't be done, or at least I know a guy that we can call, give him a quick call, and then we see how much, because it might be thirty thousand dollars to fix it. So I just made fifty thousand dollars. <throat> you make money in real estate when you buy. All right, you get the money when you sell, but you make it when you buy. If we can make it fifty thousand dollars that first day that we get the contract, we're, we're <coughs> plowing all the way to the bank because then we got a huge cushion for all the other things that we got to do. Uh, if we want to add on more stuff, I mean, we're still going to deduct for the other things, but but we know we make a huge chunk of change. And I hate to say it like this because uh, he's going to go back and change his price structure now because we're making too much money off them. But that's why I like to have these kind of people in here who talk about those kind of things that investors can make money on. I had a guy in here I talked about, we had, we had a guy talking about odors. Odors is another thing down, mold. Now we're gonna talk about foundations. So for two weeks he talked about uh, jacking up the houses and, uh, and the things he has to do to fix them. Now he's going to talk about things that actually cause them, which is water. And we have big problems here in Nashville, as they do everywhere else, with water, drying, wetting, all the other things. And uh, we didn't perfect this yet, but we got a little commercial we made for you. Okay. Uh, we, 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 want, we want to, besides having a lot of teachers teach for us, we have maybe 25 or so teachers that teach maybe 35 live classes here at Green. Monday to Friday we have uh, at least one or two classes on. If you go to our website and calendar, you'll see all the classes. Plus we have an MLM company that you bring in some people you can actually make a lot of money. But uh, one of the things we do is we actually follow around home inspectors. Not that, not that we want you not to be getting a home inspection, but we like to show people cracks, mold, what mold looks like, what termites look like, uh, you know, go in the attic and see what a leak in the ceiling looks like. Just so at least you, you know, or new people would know when they go in and check things out that Hey, maybe I should get a roofer to look at that. Irina bought a house. She even saw, felt the floor sloping down in the garage. Her friend who was a contractor said, don't worry about it, there's always a crack. She saw a crack in the garage. Uh, the real estate person said, don't worry about it. I went in there a year after she bought the house. I said, whoa, I went down to like seven inches. Here, we just had to get it jacked up you know, last year, cost 5,000 bucks, you know, and there's a few other things, but <clears throat> if she knew what she was looking at, she would have asked more questions. <clears throat> so I have, uh, Mark, is you ready with that commercial? Yes. Uh, I'm going to show you your, your introductory commercial <laughs> for, uh, for Robert Elam of USS Structural Systems, and he will throw us with some waterproofing. We do have a rich history in this area. We are the oldest and largest foundation repair, waterproofing, structural repair, basement, um, concrete leveling. We do it all. And uh, we have a tremendous reputation for maintaining as the oldest and largest. It says that all of our warranties are fully transferable. So when you guys go in and buy a house, fix it up, flip it, the new owner gets that full warranty. They don't have to pay anything, they don't have to do anything. I want you to with an address on it, not even the name on it. So for whatever the length of the warranty is, 
Uh, it doesn't matter who lives there or how many towns it sells. We don't care. Um, there is foundation problems uh, pretty much anywhere on the planet Earth because we are on soils, building on soils. Soils change. The Earth is a living organism. And you can buy a piece of land or you can be familiar with a piece of land. And if you remember, maybe even as a child, um, the way the hills looked or an area looked, and you go back 50 years later, it doesn't look the same. That's because things change. Uh, the earth moves and shifts and changes. Can you email me yet? Yeah, cool, definitely. I want to send that over to the others. They'll get a chuckle out of that. I'm Robert Elam. I'm the Public Relations Coordinator for United Structural Systems here in Nashville. And uh, tonight, we have been covering several different subjects, uh, starting with foundation repair, talking about underpinning, sinking foundations, broken footers, lifting them back into place, driving these piers um, down to bedrock, or what we refer to as substrata stable soils. We go so far, using the house as a counterweight, driving the uh, steel piers down, the sections of steel down, that uh, eventually they get to the soils that are so hard, the piers stop going down and the house, the wall begins to lift up. And uh, to, then uh, I guess last week we covered uh, concrete leveling and uh, just brick masonry. We talked about some bricks cracking around door frames of, uh, generally speaking, of garages and 16 foot wide openings. In garages, frequently it will sag over time, the lintel will sag and you'll get the cracks in the middle. A lot of people freak out thinking that's a foundation issue, it's a very simple repair. Just lifting the lintel back into place, reattaching it to the header with lag bolts and then grinding out and retuck pointing the mortar with fresh mortar, replacing any bricks if you know that's necessary. And concrete leveling, the new polychrome injections, we go in, drill very small holes, little finger sized holes inject the polyfoam underneath the concrete, it actually expands and lifts the concrete up. And uh, that comes a three year warranty. And it's a very efficient way to raise sinking concrete without having to demo and report. Um, generally much more cost effective than demoing and a lot less messy than demoing and report. And the polyfoam injection can be done while you're at work. I mean, you can leave in the morning and have a sidewalk that's leaning sideways to the moment level and usable. Uh, they only ask that you give it like 15 minutes before you walk on it or use it. So um, it's a pretty incredible product. Tonight, waterproofing. We're going to talk about wet crawl spaces, wet basements. Water is death to a house. A house, the worst thing that can happen to a house is water. It will rot the wood joists, the subflooring, it will rot the walls. Um, mold, termites. Yeah, mold grow, termites attracts uh, bugs, termites. Um, every life form on this planet uh, stations themselves close to water and need it to survive. That's why human beings, that's why every major city is built on a river or something. And 100, 200 years ago, when we were building these cities, they had to be close to water. Same thing with insects, any other life form. Whenever there's a water source, they're attracted to that and they will establish their residence near that water source. So you can have spiders, ants, uh, termites, uh, cockroaches, whatever. They're going to hang around your house if it's got a humid, moist crawl space or basement, um, which is a health hazard in itself. Uh, as someone who's been in crawl spaces on numerous occasions, I can tell you that I've been bitten by spiders. I had to do a whole round of antibiotics and steroids for a week after getting chewed on by some spider. I never even saw them. Uh, but, uh, and I've seen, I've shown my flashlight in cross spaces and seen a couple eyeballs looking back at me. And snakes uh, are very bad about going where it's moist. So it's just not a good, it's not a good thing. And the earth is naturally moist. That's why in a crawl space, codes requires that you put down a moisture barrier. Now, unbelievably, I've been in a lot of crawl spaces of homes that have been standing for decades, and it's just dirt, no no moisture barrier. And I would ask the homeowner, what, what's, why is there not a moisture barrier? Now, I don't know, well, my uncle built this home and we just never put one down, you know. And, uh, 
So it's very important to keep your crawl space climate controlled and dry. Um, you want to keep it dry because high humidity levels will cause uh, fur to grow on your joists. And when you go down there and you look up at your joists and you see fur growing on them, that's not natural. You don't want that. You don't want mold. You don't want black mold for sure. You don't want that white mold either, which is another health hazard. What people fail to think about, nobody cares about your crawl space. Nobody goes down there. It's just something that's there. I don't go in there. I don't know nothing about it. Um, generally speaking, uh, the husband uh, will find that there is a moisture issue um, 10 times more frequently than the wife. Because wives aren't going to crawl spaces. They know there's spiders down there. So they're not going to go in there. But the husband will go in there for something or the other. He stores his ladder down there or he's got room. He might put his lawnmower or something in there. And he'll see that there's moisture down there. Well, we got to get it out of there. How do we do that? There's a few ways to do that. I've had uh, several different experiences in my lifetime. Waterproofing environments, some of them were just nightmares. Uh, others were just quick and easy, no problem. And um, we'll talk about a few of those. I had one house in Tennessee we built on hills quite a bit. You can get a house that, whenever I'm speaking of a house, I'm standing in the front yard looking at the front of the house. Street view, straight up. You might have a house with a fallaway lot left to right. Um, sometimes it's pretty extreme. The lot's going down pretty good. And you get into the crawl space and water's coming on that left side from the houses up the hill whose downspouts are dumping water and gravity's taking it right on down the hill and it's gathering on the left side of this particular home and then penetrating through the crawl space, wicking its way through to the other right side wall and either building up on that wall or, or getting out of the crawl space, um, but nevertheless doing damage. You can get in there and you can see the trenches that the water over the years has dug. It's like the Grand Canyon, I mean, the little trenches at the pathway of the water has dug through the dirt. Um, a one particular house, I uh, was convinced that if we just waterproof that side, that this lady would be okay. She was a young lady, didn't have much money. So what we did was we went in and we trenched down to the foot, down to the bottom block at further level. We drilled weep holes in the bottom block, put in socked, corrugated, perforated drain pipe. The sock is geocloth. It's there to keep sediment out of the pipe so that it will continue to be free flowing. Put in the drain pipe, and then because she had such a nice little fall away lot, to keep her from having the sump pump, the mechanical device, we just went on down the back wall with our trench and then just went out. And the water was collected, taken on down, and then discharged down the hill. And that took care of her problem. Uh, on a level lot, for example, when you stand there looking at the lot, it's relatively level. Then we would come in, and I would recommend waterproofing all four walls. I really do not like waterproofing just one wall. I did this for this woman because I'm really convinced that I have also done it before and gotten bitten really hard where I just waterproof the area that I thought was a problem and then learned the hard way from the day it was coming in under rock, uh, through other avenues getting into the crawl space. So uh, we wound up losing money. I didn't get paid, the company lost money and uh, we had to go in and actually in this particular house we had to do a tic-tac-toe pattern. We had to wrap the four walls with that same pipe and gravel system and then we had to go in and do a tic-tac-toe pattern because the water was coming up from shale rock underneath just bubbling up at an underground stream or something. So we had to go in and really just every direction we could put in pipe and gravel to take this down to the sump pump and get it out of there. Um, I had a house in Columbia, Tennessee. Should never have been built. Regardless on that property, Anywhere you dug a hole, when you got to about a foot and a half or two feet, it immediately filled up in water. Didn't matter where you dug that up. And the guy actually had a koi pond out back of his house, two four inch corrugated black pipe, dumping the water nonstop into the koi pond. And then on the other end of the koi pond, it would overrun and go down into the woods. And he was not putting any water in that koi pond at his expense. It was coming out and around nonstop. He said it had been going 24-7 every day of the year for years. 
And we had to go in there. That guy's cross face was a swamp. I mean, he was, you know, right out of the jungle. We had to go in there, clean that mess up. We had to put in two big sump pumps to continually run, and they just continually run. Um, we had to countersink the sump pumps into the uh, sump basin. We countersink it down flush with the ground. We did his whole interior, tic tac toe pattern again, and wrapping the perimeter and fed to two different sump pumps so that they could keep up and keep the water out of there. Um, this guy's house should have never been built there. In fact, in Columbia, it was built when that Saturn plant came racing in uh, to the Spring Hill area. And uh, they were just throwing up houses like crazy to accommodate Chevrolet employees or GM employees. And the builders just shouldn't have put a house there, frankly. I don't know how, I don't know how they did it. They got by with it. But, um, but generally speaking, houses are easy enough to waterproof with that perimeter system. I really insist 99% of the time wrapping all four walls because you don't know where that water's coming in if it's on a level one. Um, people will say, people are under the impression that you're going to go in your crawl space and find some hole somewhere and plug it for And that's going to solve the water problem. It's not like that. On these clay soils that we live on, when they are wet and they swell, and when they get dry, they shrink, your house is literally moving millimeters, but just moving up and down, up and down. Uh, evidence of that, people will say to me, well, this door in here will work in the wintertime, but in the summertime, it won't close properly. But every winter, it closes. Or I even lived in a house once that had a phantom door. You open it, it would slowly close itself. But during certain times of the year, you open it, and it would stay where you put it. Um, that's just evidence of the swelling and shrinking of these clay soils. What happens is you get these little hairline fissures in the footer, in the foundation block that develop over decades. And when the soils get so wet and so filled with pressure from the, uh, the, from the water, they will push their way through these tiny little fissures and you'll get a little cross face. Um, so people are very disappointed frequently to hear that no, I can't go down there and find some help. There it is right there, the, the hole that's going to solve your problem. I plug it, we're done. It doesn't happen like that. Unless you've got a plumbing problem, which then you don't need me anymore, which I've seen. I went into a crawl space and as I'm in there, I hear this hissing sound that I get closer and closer. This guy's got a, a hot water pipe that's just spewing water as I'm standing there looking at it. Uh, but unless that's the case, there's very little opportunity to find a pinpoint where water would be coming from exclusively and say, this is where it's coming from and nowhere else. Um, and you certainly wouldn't want to be stupid enough to warranty something like that, because as soon as you do and it comes in a different direction, now you're on the hook. Um, so we wrap the entire perimeter, dig trench about a foot wide, all the way down to the bottom block, footer level, drill weep holes in that bottom block, socked corrugated perforated drain pipe to the lowest point, which is usually, but not always, at the crawl space entry, where we countersink sump basin and sump pump into the ground, feed that uh, water line to that sump pump. It's got an automatic trip valve when the sump basin gets to a certain level, it cuts it on. When it drops back down, it cuts it off. It's got a check valve so that the water doesn't come back in in the pipe. And uh, it's got a freeze valve on the other side, outside wall, so that it will stay free flowing in the wintertime when we get a lot of moisture around here. That's pretty simple stuff for a crawl space. Um, and that usually will take care of it. We do warranty that your crawl space will stay dry after that. I also try to get, I'm sorry, go ahead. You dig your foundation in your paper around the outside? Inside of the crawl space. I put it on the inside. Yeah, you got to go on the inside because they got HVAC units, they got patios, they got walkways, they got wooden beds. Right. Yeah. Is it what they call a French? Uh... So, yeah, it would be similar to that. Mm -hmm. It would be similar to that. But um, you, I'm, talking, I'm sorry, I didn't make that clear. You're on the inside of the crawl space um, with this simply because outside there's the wooden deck, there's the walkway. Uh, that's, that's, that's what I was pushing. Okay. There's the driveway. I mean, you can't. When a home is built and the foundation block are laid, before all these other things, decks, walkways, HVAC, all that are put in, 
that's when the contractor is supposed to be waterproofing the exterior block and footing to stop the water from penetrating to begin with. I always prefer to stop the water from penetrating to begin with. After a home is built, it's not uh, reasonable to do that because of all the obstacles in the way. And this system, we do warranty, we'll keep your crawl space dry, and we do warranty it for the lifetime of the structure and the sump pump, if necessary, gets a five-year manufacturer's warranty. Sump pumps routinely last 15 years. I've just replaced a 15-year-old sump pump in my septic tank for 2,800 bucks three weeks ago. Uh, sump pumps are really good. They last 12, 15 years on average. Um, but you get a five-year manufacturer's blanket warranty on that. If it goes out, we just come in slapping another one we're charged. But that's the best way to do that. And then I would say, always say install a new moisture barrier six mil thick black moisture barrier um, the reason being is that generally speaking if you've got a wet crawl space to begin with then your moisture barrier is pretty shoddy by that that's pretty bad and got some pretty nasty stuff growing on it so you want to get it out of there um, and we put in a new moisture barrier for people who really want to do it right and do can afford a little extra money we offer encapsulation Encapsulation is a beautiful thing. I've been in several encapsulated uh, crawl spaces. I don't currently have it in my house. I'm going to have it done in my house if I stay there. I came here from Fort Myers, Florida. I'm seriously considering going back in a few years in retirement. But if I stay here, I will encapsulate my own crawl space. It greatly improves your living environment totally. I mean, we go in, we seal off all the vents, we put a special door uh, on the crawl space that's a tight, airtight door and we put uh, uh, foam insulation on the block, on the interior if you want it, uh, which you do. And we uh, put the 12 mil thick white um, encapsulation material on the floor, up the block walls, and we wrap all of your columns. Effectively sealing your house off from the ground. We, that takes care of a lot of insect issues. It takes care of humidity problems. Um, if you've got a real humidity situation to begin with, you might actually even install a dehumidifier at that time. And I don't almost never would I sell um, encapsulation with, without selling also waterproofing first because people don't understand you can't just put in encapsulation if, if the soil is muddy down there. You're just covering a problem up. You're not curing the problem. Um, and you got to cure the problem because if the earth stays moist under your house long enough, those concrete support columns will sink and list to one direction or the other. Uh, your actual foundation walls can sink over time. Um, you gotta get the water out of it, you gotta get it dry. So I would go in and do a complete interior waterproofing system, put in a nice encapsulation, and if the humidity level is still working it, we would put in a dehumidifier and then run the drain into the sump basin so that the dehumidifier could run and empty into the sump basin, which would take that moisture out of there. Now you got a crawl space, you can go sit down and have dinner in that thing. That's a nice crawl space. And it's protecting your home. And it's improving the air quality in your living area. So where you're upstairs watching the ball game, the air quality has been dramatically improved by simply taking care of your crawl space. People don't realize that when that HVAC cuts on, when the heat cuts on, and that air has a chimney effect, that stack effect, it's pulled upward like that, it's pulling air out of your crawl space, shooting right into your house. So you do want to uh, do, you know, your best for your own home. I know these guys are flipping houses and stuff. You're not going to put all that money into that because you will never get back. I mean, people don't understand this. Uh, unless they're living there and they have gotten some education on it or they've had waterproofing problems. Then they understand it and they go for it. But uh, in a flip situation, you'll wind up waterproofing whatever wall you think it, the water's coming in from, whatever side of the house, and maybe swapping out the moisture barrier and that's where you guys will probably draw the line because you, you, you gotta you know, make it a profitable thing for you to understand that. Um, which we will do. You can always call us out again, free estimates from us, to look at more shirt issues. If you've got a basement situation, go along again, I'm sorry. Um, if you've got a basement situation, it's the uh, same thing. Uh, it's like a giant crawl space. 
we go in and usually underneath the porch, when you walk under in that porch area, um, we'll see these walls with efflorescence on them, mineral deposits, etc. on the walls where it's come through, uh, mold or mildew growing on the walls. One of the first things you want to do is make sure always that your gutter systems are in big gutters with big downspouts and that they're routed at least six to ten feet away from the house, from the foundation. I can walk into a building and there's mold on this corner and mold on this corner and I can tell you the downspouts aren't working before I can go up and check them. Now a million, a million times. Walk up the top and there's a downspout dumping straight on the ground and they're going, why is it up in here? Because it's dumping straight on the corner. And I didn't even, I couldn't tell anything. It just said, look, extend your downspouts out and it continues to pump. But basements, we go in, we break up the concrete floor about a foot out, down to the uh, bottom block, foot or level, drill the holes, put in the uh, drain pipe, and we re pour a slurry of concrete on top of that so that it is re uh, Same thing, it feeds to a sump pump and then it's kicked it back out. Uh, of course, there's no moisture barrier encapsulation involved there, but um, personally, you couldn't give me a basement home in Tennessee, but I see them every day. Uh, that are improperly built and therefore leaking water. Um, but it's very similar to the crawl space in the same system with some pump and pipe and gravel. Um, it's just that we had some concrete work to do there. <laughs> do you recommend if you're on a on a lot that's the neighbors sloping on the your lot somewhere halfway and be far enough away from your house as far as you can get doing that little V trench, trench screen thing away from your house? Yeah, I actually had one in Spring Hill where the hill, and this guy wasn't getting hit by his neighbors, it's just that he was down this hill. You get on his driveway and you go down like this, and uh, the garage was on the side where the water was uh, pummeling him. And so we couldn't do anything on the interior. Uh, it was literally going under the garage and getting into the crawl space. So on that side where the garage was, we dug a trench end to end, uh, a little further on each end, and put in uh, socks, pipe, and gravel. And just left it gravel. Filled it all the way up and gravel left it. Now when the water runs down the hill, it hits that gravel bed and it falls into the gravel. It's captured by the pipe and it was carried up the back of his house and, on, and we just wrapped around one of them down the hill. Um, of course, we buried it when we got to the end of the garage. We buried the pipe, went underground, and then kicked it out down the hill. And it worked. He was happy. Everything stayed dry. He was able to sell his house. He couldn't sell it because of that. Um, but um, everything went, worked just fine. But I told him you have to leave the gravel exposed because what's happening now, you've got soil and earth right up against this uh, garage wall, and the moisture is just sitting there and, and soaking in. We gotta have this barrier, it's like a couple of feet out of gravel, so that when the water comes trickling over the gravel, it falls down into that pipe and doesn't uh, get underneath his garage anymore. But in a case like that, and I've had other areas where you just had a low line, had a guy with a basketball court out of his backyard for his kids to play at, and there was always water laying out around that area uh, on the other side of the concrete. I trimmed out um, where the concrete ended for his basketball court. I just trenched and trimmed it out and took it on down the hill, put it in the gravel, same thing. And now when the moisture was coming toward his house in that concrete patio with the basketball court, it was captured and discharged away before it ever reached that concrete patio. And it works. It works just fine. You got to maintain it. I mean, if it gets filled with leaves and trash, you got to, you know, you got to get out there on the dry days and get your blower and just make sure it's nice, clean gravel there and not getting plugged up with leaves and stuff. But um, when you have mold issues, do you make the customer deal with that before you uh, come in? Yeah, I mean, you got to do it. I mean, you got to get rid of mold. Um, I, I, whether they do it before I come in or after they come in, I come in in a crawl space situation, it's not a, a big deal. You can do it either way. But mold people won't even give you a warranty frequently on mold. A lot of companies that we've dealt with won't give you a warranty because they will tell you, they go in, they clean it up, and the people don't fix the water problem in a year or two years, it's all back. So uh, they'll just tell them, you know, we'll, we'll get rid of the mold for you, but, you know, we're not going to, we're not going to warrant yet. Um, because they just don't, they don't want to spend the money. They, the mold's gone, you know, if it's gone, it's gone. Well. A lot of times you can starve mold out. Mold has to have food and beverage just like everybody else. 
So, I mean, without um, the humidity level, without the moisture, mold will die anyway. So, we would go in and we dry out a cross face, put in a new moisture barrier. Um, it, I would recommend getting it cleaned up because it's just unhealthy. Well, you can't waterproof until it's done. So, I didn't know if some people just said you, they just said you deal with it all and charge us whatever. So, I mean, do. Well, we would sub that out. We don't do mold. Uh, I usually refer people to a company called AmeriCare. Uh, who I worked with in the field because I would run into that and I would say, look, you got to get this mold out of here, you know, um, it's not doing you any favors. And I would refer them to AmeriCare. We'd come in and do the waterproof in AmeriCare would come in and take care of the mold and then they were off to the races. Uh, but it takes, um, I would tell a customer when they have a really wet crawl space, I'd tell them, look, you're looking at two or three months when this dries out. Um, because, um, it's soaking wet and it's in a crawl space. There's no sunshine. There's very poor air movement, and uh, it's just going to take a couple of months for this to dry out. Put those minutes. fans down there. Yeah, you can do that. You can put it in put in some of those floor fans that really kick it. Um, you can do all kinds of things uh, like that to speed the process up. And some people do, and a lot of people they just figure, okay, I'll wait for two or three months. It's it's unbelievable to me how unmotivated people are to protect their own property. I'm amazed. I mean, you have little kids who are headaches with mold, mm -hmm. and they just don't know. They don't care. I'm sure they care. But. And it's like I said earlier, uh, a, a certain percentage of the air in your home, you know, the quality of your air is affected by the quality of the air in the cross space. So you want to, you know, keep the cross space nice and clean. So that you're not breathing and stuff. You mentioned something about you know, spraying the inside with a foam like material on the inside walls. Well, it's not. We actually put um, cut styrofoam. I mean, it's uh, three inches thick. Oh, okay. And we attach it to the walls. You know, what about on the ground itself? We have a ripple board if you want it, and that is so that any water that gets underneath the uh, encapsulation material has a channel, has a way to get okay. to the. Um, get to the uh, sump pump and everything. Now we do, again, trim it out. But this dimple board kind of material, um, you can put it in there just to keep the uh, encapsulation material from actually making contact with, with the soil. Um, and it's important that, you know, what happens is that we come in, we put in this beautiful encapsulation job, then the HVAC guy comes in to do something and he punches holes in it with a screwdriver and his, you know, whatever, his pocket knife. And The reason I ask is that we're in one of the worst parts of the United States for radon. I was just wondering if that would be ever tested some of that stuff that comes with radon. It does help, but we're not going to put any kind of warranties on that. Oh, no, I really do Radon. Um, we're in the worst part. This is one of the worst areas in the whole United States right here. Uh, I, I didn't know that. I knew we had issues. I've seen people with radon um, devices, that pipe coming out of their cross space and everything. I, and I've been in those cross spaces, but um, um, we don't really have anything that covers and seals your house that's going to help. I don't, right. I don't know that it's going to take it down to the levels where you would be not affected. I wouldn't be wanting anything like that. In fact, I would tell people if, if they got an issue that I was like, well, you go to a radon guy. Don't, right. don't think I'm curing your problem with this. I, I'll just curious if that was something that, that you may have checked on. So you have. I, I haven't. I haven't. I, I always refer. We don't do radon. We don't do mold. So I don't try to talk too much to the customer about it because right. I'm afraid that I'll say something stupid and then, uh, <laughs> then they'll call me up and go, well, you said this. Well, I'm an idiot. I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, should have said that. Yeah, they listen to everything you say, man. And if you say, "Well, do this and this will happen," and it don't happen, oh my God, you're the devil. Yeah, I got a naive, naive question, uh, but I just realized. So, if there is full basement, unless it's a full basement, do Every other house actually have a crawl space. In Tennessee, there are slabs. Like in Florida, where I came from in Fort Myers, everything's on a slab. But in Tennessee, there are slabs. I would not buy a home on a slab in Tennessee because of the movement of the soil, okay. because of that clay soil. I never had a problem in my house uh, right off Davis Parkway in the Collie Point yeah. over there. Oh, yeah, in the Collie. Okay. Yeah, I had a house there, uh, and uh, it was on a slab. We never had a single problem with foundation uh, or water. I don't remember in Fort Myers. Do did they have? Did they see the crawl space? I just don't remember. No, there's no. Well, only so those, how, those old houses 
uh, those ones 19, 20, and 30, the ones stand by, down by the river there off of Palm Beach Boulevard, mm -hmm. they have some old, they used to call them fishing cottages, mm -hmm. built up on, on blocks. Most everything down there is on slab. Not, you know, any it's possible. I'm, and I know in northern Florida there's cross spaces everywhere, but uh, in southern Florida, I'm sure there are. I mean, probably out in Golden Gate or, you know, Clueston or somewhere in those little towns, they may have some little houses and crawl spaces, but these nice neighborhoods, Colony Point, for example, or Danbury or whatever, uh, they're, they're, not, they're all on slatin. Which is scary. Around here, I actually went to a house one time, the guy was trying to sell it, and he said, well, let me show you where this crack starts, and he hits the road and the garage door opens. And the crack goes right through the middle of the garage, and then there's a door that opens into the house, and there's a little four inch step up, and the crack went right up the step up, oh. and we're right across the middle of the house, into the house, and on the far wall, up the wall. And the house was literally cracking in half, and uh, he said, what should I do? And I said, I don't know, man, you got yourself a rental property. <laughs> you ain't gonna sell this thing. So you, don't, you couldn't do anything? I, the way that it was tore up. No, without a big check, right? Man, we had to go in, that's when we had to go in, tear up all the floors. Yep. And as you're lifting the exterior walls with piers, you have to also be doing foam injections in concert with the lift, the foam injections, to get this thing back to restored and then patch that crack. It's not great. I, I, seriously, I told him, I said, you, you know, you, you're either going to live here or, or is this your new rental property? Because put carpets in. Yeah, they had uh, linoleum or carpets inside everything. It's from silicone. Right. <laughs> shag, shag carpet. Talk about that thing. I built a slab house in East Tennessee once, and it rained. We didn't have to walk across it. It was a pretty size slab. And I felt like I was walking on water. You would actually move. It was a clay. We had to get all that clay out and put in a big layer of gravel. Yeah, I would it, never. But it would actually, it would actually move as you walked up. I know basements and slab homes. I just, I've seen so much that there's no way I would buy a basement or slab home in Tennessee. I, I mean, I, although in all honesty, I've seen a couple of basement homes in Brentwood with formed and poured concrete walls, steel rebar reinforced, beautiful walls. But I have seen some of them in the cracks in them. The only I would think if you wanted a basement, man, don't take the block it's only got the mortar joints everything the cork doesn't block i mean it's ridiculous but uh make a solid continuous wall you need to um, steel rebar and the holes in the block and then mortar it in uh, for a solid continuous wall battery at this form your port but, yeah because a, 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 a filled concrete block yeah. still the, the block itself is so porous yeah. it just goes around the concrete it leaves and there's going to be better yeah. and there's going to be poor solid <laughs> but he said a basement. You know, the basement with that sloping floor that like one side is open if you properly put your French drain around yeah. to get out. I mean, a full basement where it's all four sides are dug in. Mm -hmm. Now you have a swimming pool. <clears throat> um, you know, so, you know, yeah, I wouldn't have a basement unless like one side was wide open where at least I can get some of that water out of there. Yeah, um, I just, I haven't seen what I've seen. I can drive my house and I just know what's gonna cost them money. I got these 12 foot tall, 80 foot long brick retaining walls. I'm like, oh my God. You know, how long that thing's leaning over sideways and you know, it's $50,000 to demo and redo. I, I just look at these houses and I see the maintenance that's coming at them that they don't see. Yeah. And, um, so anyway. Okay, listen. All right. That does it for Waterproofing. Thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs> These are the, the quality educators that we have come in here. Wow, wow, how do That come in the green. Uh, Doc, you on here? Who's coming up again next? I know he's going to be here one more week. Right. Who's up after the um, We've got, of course, uh, Robert's going to be back next week with structural and framing issues. And then on May 30th, we have Greg DeSalvo, uh, who's a finance guy from Orlando, Florida. This ticks. He, 
He's going to do the introduction to ticks, tenancy in common. And then we have a two-part series that I think would be interesting. Uh, Sharon Restrepo, who, as you know, teaches every Wednesday morning for us, uh, except for this Wednesday, she was doing a seminar down in Fort Lauderdale. Uh, but she's going to do a two-part series on June 6th and 13th, dealing with how to buy condos effectively. There you go. I like that one. Yeah, I know you do, because you're the one who asked for that topic, so. <laughs> uh, that's why. Uh, condos, now that I'm a senior citizen, I like old people. When I was young, I never wanted to buy those condos because I always thought that maintenance fee was cut down to like $250. That was my profit. But as you get older, you realize that if I had a house and I had to watch the guy and make sure he cut the grass if he did not have to go get it cut. You know, it costs one hundred fifty dollars to take care of the roof, the windows, the exterior paint. Where well, all that stuff is already taken care of with that maintenance fee. And now I have the condo, you know, what we call the condo, you know, watchers. <clears throat> They're like a second set of eyes on my condo. So I don't have the guys fixing motorcycles on my living room carpet. And who, who, who had that in your rental properties, I know, <laughs> more than I did. <clears throat> um, so I like condos anymore. They're easy to fix. One, two bedrooms, how fast get painted. Even if you just slap new carpet down there or tile. And the only thing you have to fix is a small kitchen. Geez, you got about this much granite. <laughs> You know, so a little kitchen and a little bathroom, and you're done. Well, heck, you know, I can buy them for fifty thousand dollars in St. Pete, Fort Myers. You know, I can buy four of those for the price of one house here. And now I have four properties to spread the risk over, uh, vacancy over, four times the profit. I can get profit, the same profit I can on a two hundred thousand dollar house as I can on a sixty thousand dollar condo. Uh, so condos are my new thing. Matter of fact, even better than that, since we start sailing, because now I'm an adult, I start sailing, I can buy a 30-foot sailboat for 10,000 bucks. I can park them for 250 bucks anywhere in the world, right here at Percy Priest Lake. And I can rent them out Airbnb for 120 hours a night, and they have waterfront property. And you can't use the boat. It's not like a renting the boat. I'm renting a living quarters. So I suppose say I could buy ten, five of those instead of one fifty thousand dollars condo. <laughs> so as you, these are the crazy ideas you get when you hang around other crazy people that've been in this business for a long time. Now getting to the business degree, I'm not going to stay long. Uh, two more minutes. Because Larry said, Mark, you don't tell people about why they should join Green. Well, I mean, just that little bit of knowledge, uh, um, you know it's going to make us some money, that little bit of stuff that he said. Uh, Sharon Reshepo buys and sells property down in West Palm Beach, Florida on, on uh, Wednesday, every Wednesday at 10 o'clock. <clears throat> and she sells the property. She actually shows property that she bought off market sells it off market. If you want her to fix it, she fixes it. You want her to put a renter in there, she puts a renter in there. You want her to uh, manage it, she'll manage it. Well, these kind of stations, I'm setting up all over the country. Fort Myers, Florida, I got somebody down there to do that. Now, I want to have, they're, they're actually starting to do their shows now. Uh, Tampa, I got people in Tampa, they, they don't have their show up yet, but Jersey, Philly, um, Texas, we're working in all these places that have meetings just like this that will show property from around the world, around the country so far, but around the world that if we can't buy property here because it's gone crazy, you know, it's not crazy everywhere. There's uh, The wave is crashing at different places all over. So if you can't buy property here, you can go buy property there. So now I can watch their meeting and see what their uh, see their education that they put on, and then see who's there. So as I said before, education and networking. 
are the two things we need to make money in real estate. It's 99 it's, Right now, it's $99 a month and uh, to just get all this stuff. And we have so much stuff that's pre-recorded. You can watch on demand anytime. All this, all this meeting right here is also recorded and you can watch this over and over again or have your friends watch it. This is free. Um, Larry's class, when you were sitting next to Larry, his classes are also archived, but you'll be member only. So for right now, for 20 hours a month, you can bring in people and get paid. You get paid like $15 a person, and it's a full-blown network marketing program. So we thought that by bringing in four or five, six people, you get your membership for free. I mean, who would quit if you're getting if you're making more money than you have to. So we had a binary system before. I don't know, let's just tell you quickly where we are with this system. Steve, my partner, and Eva, our director of membership, just went out to Phoenix with the, the big dog, the number one network marketing creator, builder uh, in the world. Of this guy, when Amway wants to talk about their system and how to improve it, they go to the, the Sheffield group. Um, Mona V, all the big companies use this one group who builds them, creates them, and advises them on how to make their network marketing company attractive to all their people, how to make it profitable. That's, we are shifting over to these people now. Um, we are now in that process of taking our old one, scrapping it to a new, easier to explain, faster, better, more efficient system. Um, you can bring in people now, and we are bringing in people now. But we are attracting some pretty big horses. Uh, Larry, who's sitting over there, another guy, Ed, these guys want to bring in 50, 60,000 people into this group because they know the Sheffield group, they know that this is top-notch outfit. They love what we have here. They love the concept of it. <clears throat> if I can get more people in, more traders in here, those Dan Sikowski kind of people, well, I was meeting with a guy from Alaska, the number one wealth builder guru in Alaska, I was sitting with him uh, about three hours ago. <clears throat> These are the kind of talent I'm going to bring in here, because I don't want just real estate. Anybody can make it. We, we all make money. Do we, where's our money now? Yeah. I mean, you got like an extra million on you that, you know, we should have it. Yeah, how many millions have we made? Where's the money now? Because we didn't properly plan, we didn't get our wealth and stuff like that. So, uh, I wanted a complete business that showed people how to start and uh, and end up. And we gotta hurry up because we're pretty good. You young kid compared to how, how old you are. I look at John. I <laughs> look at 20 years ago. And I look in the mirror. Please. You know what? I, I'm all, you know, when I was talking with my life insurance guy, the guy who teaches for us, uh, and he teaches about how to use your life insurance to buy real estate, I said, oh, that's the top. When you talk to our group, uh, you know, I don't want to hear about you get a million dollar insurance policy at, at uh, $300 a month for x -Mail. These guys were way past that age. Yeah. We need the fast start program. And these guys got the cash. So he says, all right, well, every year you put in $100,000. I said, there you go. That's the one because we got to make our retirement two or three million dollars in the next two or three years. That's, you know. So anyway. Um, that's where we are now. We are changing our system to a faster, better, uh, more efficient system to make people more money in real estate and in network marketing. So I thank you all for coming. Uh, any other questions from anybody out there?
No, you can call us anytime. Learnfromgreed.com. I thank you and good night.